on November 10, 1898. A mob descended on the offices of the Daily Record, a black-owned newspaper in Wilmington, North Carolina. The armed men then moved into the streets and opened fire as black men fled for their lives. Finally, he seized control of the racially mixed city government. It expelled black aldermen, installed unelected whites belonging to the then segregationist Democratic Party, and published a white declaration of independence. Historians have called it a coup d'etat. The number of people who died ranges from 60 to as many as 300, according to some estimates. We're going to be covering this story in this episode. So if you're ready, let's go explore. The multiracial fusionist city government of Wilmington, North Carolina, was violently overthrown on November 10, 1898. Many were killed in a premeditated murder spree that was a culmination of organized months-long statewide campaign by white supremacists to eliminate African-American participation in government and permanently disenfranchise black citizens of North Carolina. The coup followed on the heels of an election for the county, state, and federal governments that restored a Democratic majority in the state legislature, which set about enacting Jim Crow legislation that disenfranchised black people in North Carolina for many decades to come. Federal Reconstruction legislation and enforcement brought the right to vote to black Americans in North Carolina and throughout the South leading to the participation of black office holders in the Republican Southern state governments that dominated the period. But the end of the Reconstruction resulted in the return of white, Democratic-ruled Redeemer governments that quickly rolled back civil rights for blacks. In the 1890s, however, the return to white dominance was challenged in North Carolina. A severe economic recession in the 1880s had been particularly hard on North Carolina farmers. Feeling that neither the Democrats nor the Republicans had been sympathetic to their plight, these farmers looked instead to the Populist, or the People's Party, to advance their political goals in the 1892 election. Although few Populist candidates won office, the combined Populist and Republican vote was greater than that of the Democrats, who nonetheless constituted the majority in the state legislature. Few of these white farmers likely cared much about the civil rights of blacks, but they realized that by making common cause with the Republicans, they could advance their political and economic goals. By agreeing not to run competing candidates in the 1894 election, the Fusion Coalition of Republicans and Populists took control of the state legislature and elected a populist and a Republican to the U.S. Senate. Working together in an 1896 election, the Fusionists retained control of the legislature and elected a Republican governor. They enacted reforms that benefited blacks and working class whites. In the 1890s, Wilmington was North Carolina's most populous city a busy commercial port with a strong economy. It was also an anomaly because a majority of its citizens were black. By comparison, the black populations of New Orleans and Louisville, Kentucky, two other cities with large non-white cohorts, were only 27% and 17% respectively. Moreover, Wilmington had a thriving black middle class made up of both professionals and entrepreneurs, and black Wilmingtonians were employed as artisans, industrial workers, laborers, members of maritime crews, and domestic workers. Building on a strong foundation of black schools, inherited status, and wealth, the black community in Wilmington had created a cohesive social and cultural environment. The city also boasted a rarity for the 19th century America that owned daily newspaper, the Daily Record, operated by Alexander Manley. Perhaps most significantly, blacks constituted a notable presence in local government. Three of the city's ten aldermen and ten of the city's 26 policemen were black, and there were also black magistrates. Black participation and prominence in North Carolina's politics and government humiliated and enraged many whites. 
two men had powerful roles in the state's political life, Josephus Daniels, publisher of Raleigh News and Observer, North Carolina's most influential paper, and Fernifold Simmons, a chairman of the state's Democratic Party, met and decided to do something about the political situation, namely to eliminate it forever by ballot or bullet voting and office holding by blacks. Theirs was not a covert operation. They openly professed their intentions, bold-facedly labeling the project white supremacy campaign. The plan called for stealing the upcoming 1898 federal and state election by exploiting the inherent racism of white populist supporters and political differences between them and the black and white Republicans, as well as by employing terrorists' intimidation and violence. The terrorist component of the campaign was provided by the Red Shirts, effectively the paramilitary extension of the Southern Democratic Party and basically the KKK in a different uniform. The heavily armed Red Shirts borrowed their loose red tunics and tactics from a white supremacist faction in South Carolina led by Wade Hampton and Senator Benjamin Art, the latter of whom had addressed Democratic gatherings in North Carolina on more than one occasion. In the run-up to the election, red shirts prowled the nighttime landscape, bursting into homes of black people and white Republicans to threaten them with the violence should they vote or simply beating them as a prophylactic measure, as well as compelling populists to vote for Democrats. This was the context for the 1898 election. When it came time in November, the red shirts were an ominous armed presence at polling places frequented by blacks and Republicans. On election eve at a meeting in Wilmington sponsored by the white supremacist campaign, Alfred M. Waddell, a former congressman and Confederate general, provided marching orders for more than 1,000 men gathered. On election day, some black and white Republicans braved the polls, but many more stayed away enough that the Democrats retook the North Carolina legislature, recaptured county governments, and monopolized the state's congressional delegation. Just to make sure the count went their way, red shirts had also attacked the polls and stuffed the ballot boxes, in some cases producing Democratic margins of victory that exceeded the number of registered voters in the districts in question. In Wilmington, the election was the same story as in the rest of the state, but with tragic differences. As the site of unparalleled black economic and political empowerment and success, Wilmington was the focus of a specially heightened white supremacist enmity. Moreover, Wilmington's multiracial city government remained in place after the November 8 election, its local government elections not due to be held until March 1899, not about to wait until March, white supremacists in Wilmington, including the Red Shirts, the White Government Union, and a group of leading white businessmen known as the Secret Nine, had a different fate in mind for Wilmington. In the days before the election, the plotters made sure that local merchants stopped selling ammunition to black customers. Conveniently, the segregated regiment of the local black militia had been called up to serve in the Spanish-American War and was still deployed in Georgia. On the other hand, two white militia units, including the Wilmington Light Infantry, were present in Wilmington, ready to augment the red shirts. And finally, having made little attempt to hide their plans to retake the government of Wilmington, the white supremacist campaign had drawn a number of reporters from national newspapers to town, whom they entertained and filled with fabricated reports of imminent race riot they claimed had been planned by the black community. On November 9th, the day after the election, the Wilmington Messenger published the White Declaration of Independence, a list of resolutions promising that whites would never again be ruled by men of African origin, that blacks would no longer be allowed to vote, 
and that white men would be given a large part of the employment heretofore given to Negroes. It demanded that Manley leave the city within 24 hours, fearing for his life. He likely had already fled. The resolutions also demanded the resignations of the mayor and the chief of police. A committee led by Waddell presented the demands to a group of prominent black citizens mandating compliance by the next morning. Well, on the morning of November 10th, Waddell led some 2,000 white men in on an attack on the office of the Daily Record, which was vandalized and raided. By 11 a.m., violence had begun erupting across the city, with red shirts, militiamen, and white vigilantes turning their guns on blacks, some of whom returned fire. Mostly, most just ran. As deadly melee ensued, Waddell engineered the forced resignation of elected officials. He was subsequently elevated to the office of mayor. Black Wilmingtonians, especially women and children, fled for their lives, hiding for three days and two nights in the swamps around the city and in the black cemetery. The next morning, prominent black and white Republican citizens were marched to the train station, commanded to leave, and told they would be killed if they returned. In the coming weeks, some 2,100 black Wilmingtonians abandoned the city. It is not known for certain how many black people perished in the massacre, but it is generally believed that as many as 60 blacks were killed. Some reports say up to 300. The coup that toppled Wilmington's elected municipal government was solidified by elections in March and the city became a model for other places that sought to impose Jim Crow laws that robbed black citizens of the vote and other fundamental civil rights for many decades to come. It would take nearly a century for accurate accounts and events of the November 1898 in Wilmington to replace the depictions of the incident which appeared in history books as the Wilmington Race Riot. Those depictions initially echoed the white supremacy campaign's version of the story, then watered it down some, added some shit out, still characterizing the incident as a race riot by black Americans that had to be quelled and that resulted in the reestablishment of good government. As they hid the truth, these accounts also buried the aspect of the occurrence that distinguished it from other racial massacres such as those in Tulsa, Oklahoma in 1921 and Rosewood, Florida in 1923. The bloodshed in Wilmington was not in any way spontaneous. It was premeditated.